Again, uh, Mahmoud uh, Sharara, uh, this is my name. I'm an associate professor and extension specialist here at North Carolina State University. And I, uh, my role today and my goal for you all is to kind of con connect the pieces on how the role for animal farms in particular or animal agriculture, specifically around ammonia. Uh, my The take home message is what are the practices out there for uh, animal producers? Sort of an idea on the ranking of these technologies in terms of their if efficacy in reducing ammonia and the cost in terms of their ranking. So I'm I'm not gonna uh, kind of reiterate the 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 great uh, presentation that David and Jesse had, but we kind of know that ammonia is is being depositing and more so in the areas of agriculture. We know that there are sources between synthetic fertilizer and animal production, and since we are here in the livestock and uh, poultry environmental learning community, our focus is really on the animal production side of things. So I really I'll I'll focus my my talk on the part that food animal production uh, uh, can contribute to ammonia and what are the interventions. So to, to kind of get us started, I'm uh, part of this really useful map. And this is really um, looks into animal, where animals are across the United States, the continental US. And, and this map was created to kind of show where counties in the United States has more animals than humans. This is not really the most important part of this slide, but it's really the fact that um, we have some of the overlap. In other words, there are certain areas that are mostly poultry or mostly cattle or so on, but there's also many areas where animals overlap across the landscape. So that adds another layer of complexity when we're trying to kind of separate uh, which type of animal farms may be contributing more uh, to ammonia. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm going to look, for instance, uh, to North Carolina, where I'm at, and maybe Iowa as well. So North Carolina, you'll find that there are two colors there in the in the lower right corner. You find yellow, which is uh, chicken, indicative of chicken, and then some orange, which is really the mix of pigs and chicken. And then if you look at the color wheel on the upper right, uh, that kind of tells you that the black colored uh, counties represents counties that have all three of the animals more than the people present, like high density of production. And you can see some of that across Iowa and Minnesota. So you start to kind of get appreciation for the fact that we don't just produce one type of animal. We, we really, they really overlap. So our practices have to kind of be sensitive uh, to these types of production. Now, now we know where animals are. Let's kind of get closer to nitrogen in particular. We kind of know, uh, many of us in this area, that the manure nitrogen is not really one type. We generally classify that as nitrogen that is ammonium nitrogen and organic nitrogen. Organic nitrogen that is still bound in, in proteins and other amino acids and will take time to mineralize in the soil. Uh, the other type, the ammonia, uh, or ammonium nitrogen or ammoniacal nitrogen is the dark blue here. And that kind of represents the type that is readily available. That volatilizes uh, whenever it has the opportunity. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that opportunity looks like. Um, so we sort of see that not all the manures are created equal. Um, the liquid manures like dairy and swine have more ammonium nitrogen in them, uh, while the solid, more solid materials like uh, beef uh, manure in a feedlot or litter, uh, poultry, uh, have much lower ammonia uh, or ammonium nitrogen. And again, uh, the difference between those two is one of them is fastly mineralizing or breaking down to release ammonia or can break, kind of become more available to the plant in the soil, while the organic nitrogen is more of a slow breakdown or slow mineralizing. That's the kind of next year nitrogen credits, if that's the basis for um, nitrogen accounting in your area for planning. So we kind of understand that when we are trying to target uh, ammonia reduction uh, or ammonia emission, we really are trying to keep the ammonium nitrogen as ammonium in the liquid and doesn't volatilize to make gash, gaseous ammonia. Now, um, in this slide, I, I wanted to kind of show you briefly um, the kind of how nitrogen flow through the production of a, of a broiler chicken as an example. Um, so you kind of see the 100% of the nitrogen that enters the farm as feed, and then you get to see how it kind of breaks down into the different areas. The main valuable part for us, the protein that we process as chicken protein or meat is 50% or 55%, um, which is the green part of that pie chart. All the other part are nitrogen um, either lost 
out of the barn before even the manure or the litter leaves the barn. And that's the gray portion or the 21%. And the another amount is still in the cake or the wet uh, litter that is removed uh, after every flock or the litter when you clean out completely after production. So we immediately recognize that ammonia starts to leave uh, the barn or the animal production site before even we touched the manure or the litter. Um, and that immediately tells us that there is an opportunity for intervention there uh, to reduce the ammonia loss from the production area or the flooring itself where animals are raised. If we took another example and we start to look at uh, uh, swine production, in this case, um, this is an example of a swine farm. Uh, this is a, a, um, a diagram from a fact sheet we have. All the resources that I use in this slide is in the references at the last uh, slide. And really what you're seeing here alphabetically, that's the feed that is entering the barn. And all of these arrows are showing the different ways nitrogen move across the farm. So we immediately see that similar to the poultry example, that there's quite a bit of ammonia leaves directly from the barns themselves. And then as the manure moves to a lagoon, and I'm using a, a swine farm similar to what we have in North Carolina, where we have an external anaerobic lagoon. Um, immediately, the lagoon also starts to contribute its share of ammonia. And as we are land applying, the land application also contributes part of ammonia emissions. Some of the work that has been done um, earlier in early 2000s started to kind of do a percentage breakdown of contributions. So you're seeing about 60%, 50 to 60% of the ammonia that leaves the swine farm leaves from the barn, again, immediately where the animals are housed. And then a quarter leaves from the lagoon. And finally, a share about 15% from the spray field or where the land application or the manure is sprayed. So this covenant gives us an idea of where the low-hanging fruits would be uh, for targeting ammonia emissions. Now, now that we know kind of all of these interventions, all of these sources or opportunities for ammonia to escape, it now we go to look into how do we start to control this ammonia. So this is a table um, that was prepared in a review by Jack Tone Rogo in early 2000s, and it kind of traced the same kind of custody of, of nitrogen. Uh, left to right, we're from the excretion all the way to land application. So as you can see, kind of highlighted in the red box is we're re reducing basically precision feeding of the animals, essentially making sure that we reduce crude protein or all of the interventions to make sure that the nitrogen that passes through the animal is only what the animal needs. Additional nitrogen will simply flow through the animal and become manure nitrogen that we have to manage. So really controlling this piece, and this is our uh, nutrition in, uh, nutritionists and experts in animal uh, production. As the manure leaves the animal, we start to look into the confinement or where the animals themselves are housed. So generally, the lower the area where manure is contacting, the better it is to control ammonia emissions. Think of all the soil surfaces or where manure is deposited. This is immediately an area for intervention. Uh, more frequent removal of manures. Um, opportunity, and then we start to become more complex and of how we can intervene here between uh, putting uh, scrubbers or biofilters or chemical interventions, uh, certainly uh, amendments to the manure surface or the whether it's the feedlot or the barn uh, or the poultry house. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail about these amendments and their application. In many areas, these amendments are also cost shared by NRCS. So there's an opportunity here to implement these applications these interventions at a lower cost to the grower or the producer. And as we move to the treatment or where manure is stored, immediately we recognize the opportunity that covering the manure storage or uh, possibly uh, installing aerators or acidifying this area, all of the different ways we can essentially reduce the opportunity for the ammonia to escape to the atmosphere. Um, again, those uh, advance between uh, relatively easier or relatively less expensive to significantly costly. Um, so it, it's generally a concern, and, and we'll talk about that as we um, uh, move forward in this presentation. 
And finally, the land application piece. We we kind of understand that the, the closer we can introduce the manure to the root area and away from being on the surface, the better chance we have in keeping these nutrients for the plant to utilize them when needed. Um, so uh, also acidifying the manure upon application, that's another way we can do that. And we'll uh, I'll share with you some quantitative example of the impact of how manure application methods affect how much ammonia you're losing there. If we started with the, um, how do we control ammonia? We kind of know that the pH of the manure has a big impact. And that's really why we always talk about acidifiers. Um, you can kind of see on the right-hand side here, the pH, as we push it uh, towards acid or lower pH, which is where the arrow is pointing, you'll see that the ammonia start to become more soluble ammonium that stays, whether it's in the solid or in the liquid or whatever it is contained. So immediately, if we added acid or acid agents, immediately we can control the ammonia emissions. And that's really the principle for a lot of the amendments that poultry producers are using today. Um, this is an example of a, uh, a treatment, a study of looking into the bisulfate, sodium bisulfate uh, as an acidifier. And you can see kind of the application once or twice. And a lot of the work is to kind of optimize the addition to get the best benefit uh, where the animals need them, to control the ammonia levels in the barn, um, and to also reduce emissions. Um, we'll talk about it, and many of us know that there are benefits to reducing ammonia, not just external to the ecosystems and air quality, but also animal performance benefits. Uh, animal health, yield, reduced disease incidences, all of these are strongly correlated with the level of ammonia in the barns. Um, so aside from some of these established uh, amendments, um, some of the research that is happening here on the campus, and I'm, I'm, I'm using here an example of the work my colleague, uh, Dr. Sanjay Shah, some of that work uh, is still in publication. Um, it, it, you looking to air cleaners, especially um, in, our, in cases where we cannot use ventilation to exchange air, especially in winter conditions and in animal production, we all have this issue of the trade-off between maintaining, paying for heat or, um, and how to control ammonia without ventilation. So essentially exchanging more air and paying for more heat or keeping the ventilation to a minimum, but risking higher ammonia that can be harmful to the animal. So an example of a technology is what you're seeing is an air cleaner unit that uses a filtration using a UV light and using a filtration media and a catalyst to break down the ammonia particles. On the left-hand side is the unit on, a, on the swine unit here on campus. And on the right-hand side, you get to see the reduction between the red bars, the input, uh, the concentration of ammonia in the input incoming air, blue and outgoing, and the points shows reduction, 50% or more, um, uh, close to 60% reduction in ammonia in the animal environment. So this is really some of the promising work and stay tuned for looking at more data on this. Um, some of the work we're doing around this area too is looking at biochar or using biochar as is um, or using acidified biochars and how that can control ammonia. This is a, an experiment um, a student uh, of mine and we put together in our lab and started to look into different biomass biochars and how they can control ammonia and greenhouse gas. Again, the work um, is uh, being prepared in a manuscript, but I pulled the ammonia effects in particular and looking to see how the concentration of ammonia in a control without a cover and how adding a cover of biochar with a dosage of acid can significantly reduce that to less than a third of the control emissions. So we kind of know that adding an acid or a cover or a both can be significant in controlling emissions from um, a storage structure. Now, when we move to land application piece, we kind of know that we can land apply one of two different ways. Um, you can see surface application, whether it's a broadcast or as we have uh, here on many areas, a traveling gun or spray irrigation. Another way is low impact where the manure is introduced very close to the soil um, uh, or possibly ejected. Um, as you might guess, they will have different amount of ammonia emissions associated with them. Um, some of the work uh, that has been done in this uh, looked into over the first 72 hours after you apply the manure, um, how does the ammonia emissions are impacted? So the red line here represents the ammonia emissions uh, in a kilogram of ammonia per hectare over the first 72 hours for broadcast. 
in the pink color, if it's an airway close to the soil, dark blue all the way uh, injection. And cumulatively, when you look at the entire land application, you get to see a significant effect of the using low impact addition of manure on the amount of ammonia uh, volatilization. So when we start to rank, um, what can we put as a practice? Um, we can, without putting a dollar sign, and certainly having a dollar sign is very important to make these decisions, but if we kind of started to rank them, some of them are really low-hanging fruit, and that's where you see a plus or a minus. Sometimes it does, it's not really as expensive. Uh, it's just making sure the routine cleaning of surfaces, especially um, in a dairy installs or in um, swine production systems, um, just general cleanliness area, the lower the surfaces that have manure inside the barn, the better. Um, in loading or unloading litter, just making sure that the area is cleaned with no layer of manure there. Um, calibration of equipments, whether these are spreaders or sprayers, a lot of the times waters or feeders, um, a lot of these are services, whether it is extension agents or service providers can provide at no cost to growers, but can have an impact on the amount of nitrogen going for land application. As we progress, we start to see adding acidifiers, adding uh, vegetative barriers, um, low impact manure application, and then adding covers, solid liquid separation, uh, injection, and possibly aerating the manure. A again, one point to keep in mind is that sometimes the cost of that intervention itself can be offset by better animal performance, uh, less mortality, less disease incidences, better feed conversion, all of these can translate to a dollar amount. Um, we are carrying out a study on a technology like this with a colleagues, economists, and animal scientists. I look forward to sharing with you the results when we have put all of these benefits and stack them. And if we start stack, look at the different uh, approaches like this, this is a curve looking at um, kind of incremental way of costing. So this is looking, uh, this study looks in Chinese agriculture and looks at all of the interventions that you can implement um, to reduce ammonia. And this figure on the, on the horizontal is looking at the po possibility for mitigation, the more right you go, the more reductions in ammonia emissions. But then again, we kind of know that the more aggressive you are, the more cost you will have to pay. So you kind of see below that dotted line, these are possibly free interventions that are low cost or no cost interventions. And then progressively, you get to see how these um, start to become more expensive. So that that is one of the ways that we can start to look at this, even at the micro level for a farm. Uh, another study looking at the same approach um, uh, for um, agriculture in another country. Um, so we kind of look here, just simply tillage, urea, precision application or bedding material can be very low hanging fruits for reducing ammonia. Um, split application or timing application better, acidifiers, covering uh, manure surfaces, amendments and so on start to become more costly, but uh, help us continue to move forward in our ammonia reduction efforts. Um, this is another way of looking at acceptance. What do we know? What has been practiced before um, uh, and their efficacy? Uh, I, I'm running a little low on time, but you sort of get the picture here. We really know animal production has a role to play in reducing our national ammonia emissions. We know there are opportunities. These are farm dependent and they're variable in cost. And we know that some of these productivity improvements in animal systems can pay uh, for these improvements. And again, myself and colleagues across the country are working on the R&D as well as modeling and data collection. Uh, so stay tuned. And um, thank you for that. I'll uh, turn it back to you, Greg.